So with that, we're going to go ahead and uh, dive in to our text. Uh, I am on uh, 322, the first positive task of schizoanalysis, and uh, we are going to go ahead and dive in. The negative or destructive task of schizoanalysis is in no way separable from its positive tasks. All these tasks are necessarily undertaken at the same time. The first positive task consists of discovering in a subject the nature, the formation, or the functioning of his desiring machines, independently of any interpretations. What are your desiring machines? What do you put into these machines? <clears throat> what is the output? How does it work? What are your non-human sexes? The schizoanalyst is the mechanic. The schizoanalysis is solely functional. In this respect, it cannot remain at the level of a still interpretive examination. Interpretive from the point of view of the unconscious, of the social machines in which the subject is caught as a cog or as a user, nor of the technical machines that are his prized possession or that he perfects or even produces through handiwork nor of the subject's use of his machines in his dreams or his fantasies. These machines are still too representative and represent units that are too large. Even the perverted machines of the sadist or the masochist, even the influencing machines of the paranoiac. We have seen in general that the pseudo analyses of the object were really the lowest level of analytic activity, even and especially when they claim to double the real object with an imaginary object and better a How to Interpret Your Dreams book than a psychoanalysis of the marketplace. As always, we dive right in. They don't fuck around with any of these chapters. Um, would anyone like to take a crack at explaining this before I do? So, schizoanalysis is actually making way out of... Um, you know, we've, we've talked previously of... Um, symbols answering to symbols so it's in into a signifying um, sphere or space or scale um, but Deleuze and Guattari are trying to get out of this to actually get back to a, a, a realness at the level of you know in, in between materiality and sociality without being into the interpretative structure of the discourse or the semiotics so basically what they're trying to to do is to approach the, the the realness of the processes that are um, to be observed instead of like trying to interpret interpret or th these phenomenons and um, play in the in the, the the realm of symbols. Yeah, when they when they talk about um, basically that uh, things can't remain at an interpretive level, and they talk about sort of the this is a simple process that is schizoanalysis. Uh, I think very much of the classic uh, shrink sitting in the couch, uh, sitting next to the couch with the analyst and laying there as they discuss what the dreams may mean and discussing how the father is the desk or the lamp on a desk inside of a dream or any sort of interpretive things. And they're saying, no, actually, we can go much simpler than that, that we actually need to get to the point where things are literally just what they are. Uh, not the symbols, not the representations of things. Yeah, as I read him, it's kind of like Nietzsche, where he talks about philosophizing with a hammer, right? There's the image of like, you know, tapping the pots or breaking the uh, icons. But in this way, we also see that schizoanalysis has also got this creative, affirmative side, right? So like in terms of methodology, they've they've now contrasted themselves with psychoanalysis, like Roger was saying, where instead of, um, instead of laying over an interpretation upon like what's happening, they're going to attack that. But in the same breath, they're also going to look at what's actually happening there. Well, I want to, uh, Muskie uh, corrected me on what I was trying to say, which is fair. It's not so much uh, that we want to get to where things are simpler, but we want to get to where things are material. Uh, not this weird idealized symbolic order of things, but instead the actual material influences that uh, affect us and drive us. The very specific thing. 
say early on a Monday. You have to forgive me a little and, bit. And to to put it simply, instead of, uh, for example, that's a methodology that I use in my work. Instead of uh, analyzing representation of disability, I follow people on the street. I, you know, I ask them what's happening. Tell me, tell me everything. And you know, so so I don't rely on their words or their stories and how they represent themselves or how they fit or not rep normative representations, but I'm trying to see how they are actually existing in the city. So like that's, you know, that, that could give you a s more simpler uh, application of this kind of work. Yeah. And I think, I think that's a really good example of what they're getting at in terms of functionality. And it's uh, to to mention specifically also the machines uh, that we're talking about don't necessarily need to be purely material because we're talking about uh, uh, the machines themselves also being imaginary, also being virtual at some level as well. So we'll get into that though. Um, any any questions on this first paragraph? All right. The consideration of all these machines, however, whether they be real, symbolic, or imaginary, must indeed intervene in a specific way, but as functional indices to point us in the direction of the desiring machines, to which these indices are more or less close and a final. The desiring machines are in fact, uh, the desiring machines in fact are only reached starting from a certain threshold of dispersion that no longer permits either their imaginary identity or their structural unity to subsist. These instances still belong to the order of interpretation, that is to say the order of the signified or the signifier. Partial objects are what make up the parts of the desiring machines. Partial objects define the working machine or the working parts, but in a state of dispersion, such that one part is continually referring to a part from an entirely different machine. Like the red clover and the bumblebee, the wasp and the orchid, the bicycle horn, and the dead rat's ass. Let's not... Um, let's not... The, the working machine in the text is, uh, it appears in French also. Mm. The link. So they use the term working machine in French. Oh, interesting. Let's not rush to introduce a term that would be like a phallus structuring the whole and personifying the parts, unifying and totalitizing everything. Everywhere there is libido as machine energy, and neither the horn nor the bumblebee have the privilege of being a phallus. The phallus intervenes only in the structural organization and the personal relations driving, deriving from it where everyone, like the worker called to war, abandons his machines and sets to fighting for a war trophy that is nothing but a great absence, with one in the same penalty, one in the same ridiculous wound for all, castration. This entire struggle for the phallus, this poorly understood will to power, this anthropomorphic representation of sex, this whole conception of sexuality that horrifies Lawrence, precisely because it is no more than a conception, because it is an idea that reason imposes on the unconscious and introduces into the professional sphere and is, by, and is not by any means a formation of this sphere. Here is where desire finds itself trapped, specifically limited to human sex, unified and identified in the molar constellation. But the desiring machines live on, the contrary, under the order of dispersion of the molecular elements. And one fails to understand the nature and function of partial objects if one does not see therein such elements. Rather than parts or of even a fragmented whole, as Lawrence said, analysis does not have to do with anything that resembles a concept or a person. The so-called human relations are not involved. Analysis should deal solely, except in its negative task, with the machinic arrangements grasped in the context of their molecular dispersion. Um, I'm going to go back to the part that I think I can actually explain, and then I've got questions. Um, when they when they talk about the uh, the machined energy, the way that we talk about partial objects that are actually joined with objects of another machine, they use the examples uh, of uh, before Roger interrupted uh, the red clover and the bumblebee, the wasp and the orchid, the bicycle horn, and the dead rat's ass. Uh, the example of the wasp and the orchid we've actually been discussing in a different channel. 
But the core idea is that, uh, as Deleuze and Guattari actually talk about earlier, the wasp, and there's an orchid specifically that looks like a wasp, and it uses that sort of form of looking like a wasp to attract wasps, which causes it to get pollinated, and the wasp thinks it's having sex with another wasp. The point they make is that at any point, the wasp is ultimately becoming orchid, and at the same time, the orchid is becoming wasp. There is a uh, interdependency there and a simultaneity to what they are at any given moment. That is what they're talking about when they talk about partial objects, that the machine of the orchid wasp, for example, the orchid wasp machine, isn't necessarily the totality of it. It's got these partial objects inside of it. It's not really a whole wasp. It's not really a whole orchid. There's other pieces of it. And being aware of that is how these things sort of switch back and forth. And yes, Lou, this is basically Bergsonian thinking. Uh, like I said, Bergson is uh, very foundational to a lot of this, and this is absolutely up that alley. Now, first, I, I want to make sure. Uh, was my interpretation generally how people are seeing it? With the wasp and the orchid and the partial objects and how machines can be identified? Yeah. Yeah, I even think about it in terms of like, so when you talk about like the reproductive aspects of the flower, like the pistol, right? Like, normally we talk about those, at least as I remember our high school uh, botany course, but uh, normally you hear about that in terms of male and female, right? Like the pistol is the female part of the uh, of the flower and, and so on. But I think to lose and Guadri's point here is that it's, it's not, one, it's not anthropomorphic. And two, to that point, like, all these different pieces, right? So they're, they're not talking about partial objects in terms of some like lost hole or like uh, some uh, some unreach, some, some totality that it's a part of. They're talking about how these, you know, like uh, Brooks, you're, you're saying, like how these different uh, machines connect with each other. And so you, you don't really have like, we're talking about the wasp orchid machine, but within that assemblage, there are different parts interconnecting and breaking with one another. And they are also each their own determinate machine. Uh, so, so again, when we're talking, it's going to be really important as we talk about uh, sort of all the machines, the desiring machines inside of us. We're not talking about either whole units of machines or partial that it's about understanding all of these pieces and how they interoperate in order to create drives and utilize libido as machine energy. That's the bigger deal. So in the case of the orchid and the wasp, we have the orchid wasp machine. We also have the wasp and we have the orchid. And it's, so it's three machines basically working and being talked about as one. And it's about breaking things down in that way, as well as all of the pieces of each one of those. One thing I was going to say, Brooks, is uh, it's really a minor point. Um, I, I don't think you were even saying it in like a really serious way. It was just sort of like a transition, but kind of interesting to what you were saying right before we read this passage with like, well, it's not just these like actual material machines. It's also all these other kinds of like imaginary machines and stuff like that. I, maybe there's room for that in Tools and Guitar's sort of like cosmology. I'm not sure. But I, what I love about this section is how much it it kind of once again goes back to like answering that question. Even when they go in a few paragraphs, we'll get to the bit where they say something like the, the conversion of a bit of energy isn't something that occurs at a specific moment, but it's like a constant condition of the system itself that the more you kind of go on this, like, as they say, schizoanalytic bent, it, the conditions, the virtual conditions that create the system aren't really separate from their material reality. You know, it's like, it's, it's impossible to separate because because it has to exist at every point in the you know system or the organism, it's not something that isn't material or you know you, you just kind of get beyond these boundaries or these binaries. And I think it's when they get onto the partial objects, all the stuff of connecting partial objects and bodies of the organs, and you know the one being part of the other. It, this has been one of the most helpful sections for me in clarifying that. I think. So my question with this section is uh, the second half of the paragraph. Uh, the first half, I think I grasped fairly well. 
uh, the second half when they start talking about the phallus. And uh, everywhere there is libido as machine energy, and neither the horn nor the bumblebee have the privilege of being a phallus. The phallus intervenes only in the structural organization and the personal relations deriving from it. And they go on, this is a long sentence. Uh, which is probably a wrong one for me to pick out. Why are they bringing up the phallus here? How does this relate back to what, uh, for example, Alyosha was just talking about or I was talking about? It feels like a critique, but uh, they don't say anything too explicit here. To, to, get, to kick off the discussion, I think the, the first thing that jumps to mind is that right in psychoanalysis, especially with like psychosexual development um, and, and like libido uh, and libidinal flow is like the phallus and castration are kind of the central central things that uh, a lot of this um, a lot of the discourse is organized around. So really we talk about Oedipus and like, you know, the the relationship of the the tension between the father and the son, the child, right? That uh, that tension for wanting to kill the father, uh, to kill like uh, what uh, enables you, right? And then to like uh, take sort of take hold of the mother in that sense, right? Uh, and kind of what they're, I, I think like psychoanalysis kind of says in, in that discourse to organize it is the phallus and this idea of castration. So what they're getting at here is desiring machines are not going to be a new privileged object or a new centralized uh, organizing factor. They're not going to be a signifier, essentially, is what they're saying. Well, yeah, because yeah. remember that. Sorry, go, Lou. There's also the aspect um, of the machines becoming actually um, a kind of phallus for the discourse of of schizoanalysis in, in, in the more meta way, I think. Like when we are just looking for um, the concepts that they lay he out here and basically identify um we basically go back to identifying everything we encounter in analysis with the examples they have here then we uh, bring back um this representational logic and with it um the phallus in the through the way we discourse in analysis right I was going to say it also brings back to the, remember, our, um, first in this section, they're saying the point of talking about machines and schizoanalysis in this way is you start from a point of dispersion, where there's a multiplicity of partial objects and flows occurring all at the same time. And that it's not, um, you know, they, they talk about, actually, in the previous chapter, we just read that section where they say that psychoanalysis mistakes uh, the lack, the, I'm using that colloquially, the, the apparent non-connection between different flows and points and partial objects as a lack, and then turns that into this whole system of, of analysis and thinking that that lack or those that those absences have to be explained rather than, you know, in the schizo approach that they advocate of like, these are actually part of how it is created. So that lack of a link between points that in, they'll, in the coming sections, they'll talk about, you know, that it's part of it. It's not even that... Um, one organism has a bunch of things going on within it, but this is like, they're, they're trying to as hard as they can to not talk about the subject, <laughs> you know, so they're trying to talk about how do, do things like the subject end up being a byproduct of these processes? Well, it can't start. You can't start from the subject and end with the subject, which is kind of what ends up happening in the psychoanalysis is like, you start with a, a despotic signifier and everything seems to come from like a single point and, you know, uh, it's kind of redemption in the end. But, uh, yeah, the, the idea of dispersion and the lack of a link between points. It was even well. Anyway, I'll, I'll bring this up in the chat. But this uh, is this is a great explanation. This is this is like book worthy. The the way you just put this, it's perfect. <laughs> okay, I'll take that as a compliment coming from Roger. Oh, totally, man. Totally, because I was I was about to add something. I really don't have anything to add. You know, let's start well, from well, the, well, the the multiplicity instead of the, you know the unity of the structure and you've you've summed it all i'm glad so i was recording last, the last thing i was just going to say is for the bergsonites among us i was just going to remind uh people who've been coming to the classes of the 
the metaphor that Bergson uses about when he's talking about intuition and rationality. He talks about he kind of makes fun of rationality and he gives the example of a of a pilot in the sky and a scuba diver. And the way we would tend to think of it is like the person in the sky is the one who's thinking rationally and finding things and pointing out to the scuba diver where to dive. But the in Bergson's like model, he kind of inverts it and he's like, well, the the scuba diver is really just they have to just follow blind points. They're being told, go here, go here. And they're just making abstract connections between these points and trying to make it make sense. Whereas the one who's seeing things from the sky has this like immediate intuitive grasp of the land and what they see. And I was just reading this, thinking about the, the links and the lack of link between points and how, you know, psychoanalysis in a way is, it, that's what it does. You know, it, it, it doesn't see, it's, it has all these gaps between the points and it doesn't know what to do with them. So it's trying to draw this massive structure in line to make it all make sense. But we need to kind of pull out and see it from a more imminent perspective. So if we want to take this example and sum it up in really something simple, psychoanalysis would start with the map and would try to identify the thing, uh, the things that the, the person in the plane sees. And uh, schizoanalysis would start from the real connections that are being made either in the perception um, of the scuba diver or the plane uh, driver. all said really well um to just because they end it with a very i think a very nice way to make a fine point on that uh, analysis does not have to do anything with anything that resembles a concept or a person human relations are not involved it's a really nice way to put a top on that thank you by the way for explaining a lot of that i was struggling a bit with it um, any uh, last comments before we move to the next paragraph? I would just like to discuss one little thing. And uh, what they say, as Laren's said, analysis does not have to do with anything that resembles a concept or a person. The so-called human relations are not involved. Yes, the part I just quoted. Yes? Yes. So... My question is because I don't I don't specifically follow this part of the text. Are they still um, questioning psychoanalysis in its original form, or are they saying that analysis could be reintegrated into a schizoanalysis uh, moment, and they're using Lawrence as you know pointing out to something that is real, or you know are they criticizing him? I, I don't follow exactly what they're trying to do here. As I read it. They're saying what Lawrence understands is that um, that man doesn't just you, you don't just begin with man, right? So like the, like we said about the wasp and orchid, we don't just begin with a wasp and orchid, and that's like a totality in its um, in themselves, right? Because all these different um, partial objects are connecting and libidinal um, flow is moving through them, right? It's not about the wasp and orchid in the, in the sense of those like aggregates. It's about how these um, all these different parts and uh, are connecting with each other, desiring to connect with each other. What's in their way in that? So I think they're, I think they agree with Lawrence. And, and when they say it's not like about human connections, they're saying like, you as a person are not necessarily moving your desiring machines, right? It's quite likely your desiring machines are moving, and you're kind of along for the ride. Yes, it's not, and I would say. It's uh, them saying that there's a lot more complexity when they say the so-called human relations are not involved. When I, how I read that is them sort of saying it doesn't matter how you and your father get along. That's the so-called human relations. We're not having that conversation. What I want to talk about is uh, the way that all of the different complex machines that your father happens to have in his life and that you have and how they're communicating and how they've affected you over time, how your machines have been built around that. It, it changes than just having a conversation about whether or not you like your dad, which is pointless. Okay. Because my, my question is that because I see people as machines, as, you know, aggregates of little machines. So when they say the so-called human relations are not involved, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, why do we break this, this part of, of, of the equation into the assemblage? 
this is my main question because I, 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 I thought that they were trying to reintegrate human relations into the medical diagnosis or the psychoanalytic diagnosis of the pure individual, you know? I think they so are. Kind of I, I think they are doing that. Uh, the, the human in this case, because it's the creation of the subject on the virtual service that is all of these machines, uh, analyzing how one virtual object interacts with another virtual object is not how you deal with fixing complex computer machinery. The reality is there's a million different pieces. Yes, it's two machines that are interacting, but you need to see them not as two machines, but as collections of thousands of them. Uh, Latour talks about this greatly in, uh, I, I would say, actor network theory is worth bringing up now, however anyone may feel about Latour. Um, when you have uh, two networks, what was commonly done is you'd you have a employee diagram. It's Steve hands this document off to Tom. Tom hands it off. Where are the problems? It's not the point. Instead, you need to actually go, okay, what are the pieces of machinery they're using? What are the computers they're using? How do those computers work? Where is the actual breakdown into all of those tiny machines? The same way you, when you go uh, and you talk to, how, do you, how are you getting around the city? Are you able to walk? Are you stepping? Where are you stepping? How are you stepping? These are the little machines. The way that city planning was done for a long time is taking the molar aggregates of these people and going, hey, so everyone named Steve likes, they, they, they go to work. That's it. They don't talk about how they step, what their gait is, how long their gait is, where they're trying to go. It's just that Steve's going to work. It's a very simplistic molar view of all of it. And so it's about breaking those things down even further is how I read it. Well, I totally agree. It's just that I, I, it's just the way that the paragraph is written that I, I got lost into it. I, I think when they refer to human relations or relationships, they mean that ultra simplified subject to subject rather than machine aggregate of machines to aggregate of machines. Which, oh, okay, so I'm reading into it <laughs> too much. I, I think so. I, I think they're again they're they're talking against here. Uh, as Alyosha said, this is kind of a critique of Lacan or Freud or whoever else. Um, and very much in those, it is about talking to the subject about how the subject sees their own relations versus breaking down them into dozens of hundreds of machines and having that discussion. What helps me is when they reference Lawrence earlier and they write, this entire struggle for the phallus, this poorly understood will to power, this entire, uh, excuse me, this anthropomorphic representation of sets this whole conception of sexuality that horrifies Lawrence precisely because it is no more than a conception, because it's an idea that so-called reason imposes on the unconscious, introduces into the passionless sphere, and I'll end it there. But get to that point, really, if people are produced by the assemblages, right, it's, it's, so it's the inverse of what we usually do. Right? We usually start with people and look at how that all connects, but... It's the inverse now, right? We're talking about how people are produced and these relationships are produced rather than producing. All right. Uh, I'm going to continue on to the next paragraph. Let us therefore return to the rule that's so clearly stated by Serge Leclerc, even if he sees this only as a fiction instead of the real desire. The elements or parts of the desiring machines are recognized by their mutual independence such that nothing in the one depends or should depend on something in the other. They must not be opposed determinations of the same entity, nor the differentiations of a single being, such as the masculine and the feminine in the human sex, but different or really distinct things, distinct beings as found in the dispersion of the non-human sex, the clover and the bee. As long as schizoanalysis has not arrived at these disparate elements, it has not yet discovered the partial objects as the ultimate elements of the unconscious. It is in this sense that Leclerc used the term erogenous body, not to designate a fragmented organism, but an omission of pre-individual and pre-personal singularities, a pure dispersed or anarchic multiplicity without unity or totality, and whose elements are welded pasted together by the real distinction or the very absence of a link. Such is the case in the schizoid, con uh, schizoid sequences of Beckett, Stone's pocket mouth. 
a shoe, a pipe, a bowl, a shoe, a pipe bowl, a limp bundle that is undefined, a cover for a bicycle bell, half a crutch. If one indefinitely runs up against the same set of pure singularities, one can feel confident that he has drawn near the singularity of the subject's desire. To be sure, one can always establish or reestablish some sort of link between these elements, organic links between organs or fragments of organs that eventually form part of the multiplicity, psychological and axiological links, the good, the bad, that finally refer to the persons or to the scenes from which these elements are borrowed structural links between the ideas or the concepts apt to correspond to them. But it is not in this respect that the partial objects are elements of the unconscious. We cannot, and we cannot even go along with the image of the partial objects that their inventor, Melanie Klein, proposes. This is because, whether organs or fragments of organs, the partial objects do not refer in the least to an organism that would function phantasmatically as a lost unity or a totality to come. Their dispersion has nothing to do with lack and unification or totalization. With every structure dislodged, every memory abolished, every organism set aside, every link undone, they function as raw, partial objects, dispersed working parts of, mach of a machine that is itself dispersed. In short, partial objects are the molecular functions of the unconscious. That is why, when we insisted earlier on the difference between desiring machines and all the figures of molar machines, we were fully aware that they were both contained in and did not exist without one another. But we had to stress the difference in regime and in scale between the two machinic species. So uh, basically they uh, heard your question 50 years ago and decided to write an answer, Roger. They're so nice. It was very kind of them to draw it out so nicely for us. Um, as a quick summary, uh, this was actually very much an answer to Roger's question about how people exist and the personal relationships between people, what partial objects are, how these things function, and where they fit inside of the molecular molar side of things. Like literally just answering Roger's entire question. So that's a really interesting way of writing because, you know, they, they make the confusion and then they answer their own confusion. This is, I love that. Uh, apparently still works long after they've gone. So, good section. But you can also relate it to the, that whole, again, the non-human sex thing that they talked about before. So this idea of an erogenous body, it's like when we think of the erogenous body, we shouldn't be thinking of like the bee or the, or, uh, you know, the, the clover or the wasp or the orchid. It's like that conjunction, that, that hyphenated phrase of the wasp and the orchid, like that's the erogenous body. That's the virtual meeting point at which all of these different, like they say, pre-individual, pre-personal singularities can produce something else. Like th this is very much drawing on Simone. And I, I am the worst of the Simone and students because I only attended like <laughs> a few sessions. So I don't know if anyone else is here who could talk about that. But, uh, but that very much, that pre-individual, the idea of like metastable systems that produce, you know, later effects. That's what I'm reading in, in this and, and getting outside of, when we see body, we tend to think subject. But body is like, it's a kind of organism that, like our toes, you know, body without organs, it, it stretches over a variety of uh, intensities, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you, oh, sorry. Go ahead. You brought up Simone, and I'd actually, like, I always do what related more to Bergson, because it's very close, actually, to, like, the whole orchid and the bee example is very close to um, the example Bergson uses to introduce the concept of sympathy in um, creative evolution, um, where he talks about this wasp and um, the beetle in which the wasp lays their, um, their eggs and the larva eat the, um, eat the, um, eat the beetle, but for this to happen the way it happens, the wasp seems to have, seems to need an intimate knowledge of how the beetle works, for otherwise she would kill him. And um, what Bergson there does is basically he says, well, the intellect always touches on these two 
animals as two objects, but what's really happening is that we are witnessing one system, one organism who has two, who is realized in two acts or two tendencies, um, the beetle and the wasp. And oh. um, there's something ver very similar going on here with, um, with the um, stuff that uh, Deleuze and Gattari are talking about. Yeah, totally. And um, if, if we want to bring back, bring it back to like a really short summary of the understanding of Simondon and this, uh, the subject <clears throat> being in Simondon is something that is metastable. So for example, me, Jan, or Roger, as you know me, uh, as a subject, I am something that is temporary, you know, and something that is always moving. My body at this right moment is something that keeps changing, keeps, you know, rearranging, reassembling itself with its environment, its ecology. So basically, uh, I'm not really myself, but I'm a sum of material elements, but also relations, intra-relations within my body, but extra relations in the way that I interact with computers, I eat food, I live in a city, you know, there's the temperature regulation and all of this. So basically, this, this whole train of thinking makes it that the priory object are not the ends, but the relations that are producing the ends. In, in the sense that, you know, Uh, we need to look at relations of functioning and connection prior to looking at the individual objects that are being produced by those relations. So it inverts, you know, the type of analysis. Any other questions or comments? Feel free. Uh, anyone who's not already typing, uh, feel free to jump into AO discussion chat. <clears throat> um. But I think I'll move on to the next paragraph. It is true that one might instead wonder how these conditions of dispersions, of real distinction, and of the absence of a link permit any machinic regime to exist, how the partial objects thus defined are able to form machines and arrangements of machines. The answer lies in the passive nature of the syntheses, or, what amounts to the same thing, in the indirect nature of the interactions under consideration. If it is true that every partial object emits a flow, it is also the case that this flow is associated with another partial object and defines the other's potential field of presence, which is itself multiple, a multiplicity of anuses for the flows of shit. The synthesis of connection of the partial object is indirect, since one of the partial objects, in each point of its presence within the field, always breaks the flow that another object emits or produces relatively, itself ready to emit a flow that other partial objects will break. The flows are two-headed, so to speak, and it is by means of these flows that every productive connection is made, such as we have tried to account for with the notion of flow skiz or break flow so that the true activities of the unconscious causing the flow and breaking flows consist of the passive syntheses itself insofar as it ensures the relative coexistence and displacement of the two different functions. <sighs> um, does anyone have an example of a good version of this partial object that does this break flow uh, as part of a machine? How, how I heard them Just real quick, uh, the the wasp and the orchid will take as a machine because that's a kind of what they're talking about. Uh, what would the partial object be in that machine? What what breaks off? What flows are created? What flows break? I think there's something important there um, that we shouldn't look for. Like I think the partial objects are more um, um, uh, heuristic than things that the object itself offers to us, right? Because then we get back to the representational mode of analysis. So... Um, the, the way that I... I've asked myself this question. Sorry to interrupt, but I've asked myself the question, the, the, this question, like, do we start with the material things or relations or... But it's it's not well said into anti Oedipus, but it... it You know, there's the idea of the diagram, and the diagram gives functions. And 
I think, and maybe you know, I'm just I'm just interrupting real quick, and I'll let you go after that. I think that we should start with function. So the partial object is starting at the function between um, two elements into a chain of production. And function at that point is something that is always very directed. So when I said earlier, you know that the uh, we should start from the relation instead of the terms. And when they say the flows are two edited, that's the thing, you know, they connect stuff together. We should start with the connections in themselves and how they produce the elements that are interacting instead of starting from the elements and try to analyze the relationship between them. Sorry, Lou, all yours. I guess we could start with the notion of affection here uh, that is later developed by uh, Deleuze in his uh, Bacon book and the cinema books as well as in um, What is Philosophy? Because uh, when we look at um, when we look at this affections, it's still a process. Uh, like a thing gets affected by another thing and this affection also um, represents a form of um, affectability, um, so to say, and Deleuze anal analyzes this uh, quite deeply with uh, Spinoza. Um, so when we look at effects, it's uh, this this crossing of specific elements and their process, their function and their specific uh, way of affecting um, already um, dispositioned entity, so to say. And uh, by that, we can um, look parallelly at elements and relations at the same time, if this makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's that's totally it, you know, and uh, I'm going to say again, in my own work, but <laughs> this is this is what I settle for, you know, try to see people as an assemblage of affects and uh, uh, relation uh ecological relations so always see them in a setting always see them as a synthesis of competencies and skills that have been acquired into a prolongated presence into an environment always interacting because you know let's 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 talk bro stuff you know you go in the gym you are being you are the product of lifting the weights you know and the weights are, you know, they're stable, their temporality is different than yours, but your muscles are breaking down from this interaction and they keep building. So your, your body is changing and this gives you like a more rapid uh, form of visual change. And, you know, you can, you can actually see the transformation into a body. But through life, for example, that stuff happens to you also in the form of like muscle building, perception, you know, uh, depending on what you do in life, who you are, what your interests are, you will perceive different things into an environment. And, you know, the, you are just being produced. It's not because there's different things in the environment. It's just that your world is completely different because you emerge from a set of relation instead of another. Definitely. And I guess this is uh, these, this more ecological view on um, surroundings or better Umwelten in, in German um, is still this this very deep connection of Deleuze to um, Simon Don as well as Quand Guillem and in his later works um, uh, after a thousand plateaus and in what is uh, philosophy when he really um, tries to bind um, Jakob von Uexgild's notions uh, into his own thinking um, the way of thinking in uh, specific functional uh, circuits of um, um, of Merkwelten and Umwelt uh, and Wirkwelten. I think also though this section, what's important when they say the flows are two headed, and my, I think we might be repeating the same point over and over, but it is yeah. what the flows are two headed, not just because they they flow and they break what they specifically say if it is true that every partial object emits a flow it also is the case that this flow is associated with another partial object and defines that other's potential field of presence which is itself multiple the synthesis of connection of the partial objects is indirect since one of the partial objects in each points of its presence 
within the field always breaks the flow of blah 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 so like <clears throat> if you want to you want to be crude and disobey roger's orders and think of it in terms of the world like if you think about biology the way it's taught to like s- s- school students you you always get the example of like uh, you, you muted you think- yourself aliosha oh, i always do that uh, yeah, you get examples of a biological systems that are symbiotic. So you get different kinds of animals, you know, supposedly, again, in a conventional explanation, you'd be like, oh, well, this animal can't do this, and it, it lacks X. And then so this other animal does this for it. And so or you could break it down to like bacteria in your gut or any of those things. And what they're trying to say, I think, is that you can't just look at the because this goes back to the problem of like that psychoanalytic model of looking for absences and and the you know the 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 absence or the non-connection they call it this real distinction the pure difference of all these multiplicities look seeing in that like lacks and absences instead of seeing like you need to see from each flow the the fact that like from a partial object okay it emits a flow but it also kind of contains the potentiality to uh interact with another flow and then then the way that happens is through a, a break but it's not it's so all i'm saying is that it's not just that flows sometimes connect and sometimes they break it's that like every even in the beginning of the book they talk about this that like every flow has to like have a pre uh you know a conceived uh, sense or whatever you call it that something can be taken out of it you know so like rather than see these two animals as we were saying earlier as somehow lacking or something like if, if you pull back a bit further you see well they're they're actually both productive elements of another kind of system just at a different order of perception or a different regime of, of perception. So you, you need those potentialities. Like they're all different orders of metastable states, basically. Yes, that's totally, that's totally right. You know, because in assemblage, and that's the thing, that's the problem we have with the idea of structure. We sense one structure as something that is like a single unit, but assemblages are like, um, uh, Russian dolls, and you know that's the it's the example that I give. An assemble an assemblage is always within another assemblage, which is un, into another assemblage. That if you see it into a vertical manner, but it can happen into an horizontal manner also. So basically, you know, parts of an assemblage are being produced, but they are being they are producing other assemblages as well. So it's it's. It's this whole ecological, really large ecological field that we need to see when we're talking about one of the nodes, because that node has effects. It's like a trickling effect to everything else, and everything else has effects on it. And with that, I think I'll move on to the next paragraph, unless we have uh, any last notes or mentions. Now, let us assume that the respective flows associated with two partial objects at least partially overlap. Their production remains distinct in relation to the objects Y and X that emit them, not the fields of presence in relation to the objects A and B that inhabit and interrupt them, such as the partial A and the partial B become in this regard indiscernible, thus the mouth and the anus, the mouth anus of the anorexic. They are not indiscernible solely in their in the mixed region since one can always assume that having exchanged their function within this region they cannot be further distinguished by exclusion there where the two flows no longer overlap one then finds oneself before a new passive synthesis where a and b are in a paradoxical relationship of included disjunction Finally, there remains the possibility, not of an overlapping of the flows, but of a permutation of the objects that emit them. One discovers fringes of interference on the edge of each field of presence, fringes that testify to the remainder of a flow in the other, and form residual conjunctive syntheses guiding the passage or the heartfelt becoming from the one to the other. A permutation involving two, three, in organs, Deformable abstract polygons that make game of the figurative Oedipal Triangle never cease to undo it. Through binarity, overlapping, or permutation, all these indirect passive syntheses are one and the same engineering of desire. But who will be able to describe the desiring machines of each subject? What analysis will be extracting enough for this? Mozart's desiring machine? Raise your ass to your mouth, ah, my ass burns like fire. But what can be the meaning of that? Perhaps a turd wants to come out. Yes, yes, turd, I know you, I see you, I feel you. What is this? Is such a thing possible? 
from a letter by Mozart cited by Marcel Moore. I'm reading the footnote, uh, page 124. Having come of age, he found the means of concealing his divine essence by indulging in scatological amusements. Moore shows convincingly how the scatological machine works underneath and against the Oedipal cage. Why, why did they end it on Mozart eating poop? There's your Western values. Yes, there we go. Uh, embrace tradition. Embrace Mozart tradition. Which one? <laughs> um, all right. So aside from the odd math and the uh, sort of remedial algebra they, they're playing with early on there, the, uh, I, I would love someone to explain kind of overall what they're trying to say with this paragraph because how I sort of took it and take it is this is overall them continuing their critique, sort of going back to that place where they're now once again sort of making fun of the way that psychoanalysis traditionally deals with an analysands and mocking that. Um, I think these last two paragraphs are just them sort of re going over the passive synthesis of the unconscious and, um, explaining how these passive synthesis they're, they're about to explain how these passive synthesis result in the molar structures that they introduced in like chapter three. So, so then what is the answer to their question? They ask at the end here, I guess, uh, who will be able to describe the desiring machines of each subject? What analysis will be ex exacting enough for this Mozart's desiring machine? I, I think they're given an example of, Maybe it feels possible, sarcastic. Possible, yeah, yeah, a possible, not possible way. Yeah, I think it's it's because it's very difficult to like. Well, I don't know, but I'm I'm having I'm, I'm having difficulty, sort of, with the part of this work where we're supposed to be able to sort of, div I guess, divine these machines based on, but we can only do that based on like talking about them, right? Of, the, of representing them, which is already sort of a tension. And so that maybe this question is sort of ironic because I think they say later that like schizoanalysis analysts are allowed to be, you know, innocent, allowed to make mistakes, but maybe that's not exactly right. I read it as a challenge. So, right, like we know what psychoanalysis is going to say about Mozart here, right? It's a problem of psychosexual development and uh, the anal and the oral stage or something that matter, right? Uh, but, but their point here is, or they're going to edipalize it, right? Like they allude to in the footnote. But the point here is that, the, so if we're not going to just take the, you know, the, di the diagrammatic way out and say, well, yeah, all this is a uh, functionality according to the Oedipal triangle, but instead, the unconscious itself made some mockery of the triangle by <laughs> without even knowing that it is, right? Yeah. So in that manner, right, schizoanalysis is going to have to, and this is part of the positive um, aspect of its methodology and task, is going to have to deal with what Mozart wrote here, not as though he is some like uh, tortured uh, genius with psychosexual developmental issues, but uh, as he's act like affirming what he's actually doing here, right, which is talking about um, you know, turds and, and mouths and, and that, right? Like, without necessarily having a um, a sexual deficiency. Um, on this, I will go back into the French version because I just realized it's a little bit different. And in French, they say, "Tendez votre cul jusqu'à votre bouche." Like, make a tension between your ass and your mouth. It's not saying that put your your ass next to your mouth. It's saying that how can you give a mouth? to your anus, into this old conduit. And when they say, um, but what can be the meaning of that? They don't say this in French. And they say, what, what does it want to say? Not the meaning, but what does it want to say? Like, if you give a mouth to your anus, what would the anus say? So it's a form of um, giving a voice to a partial object. Yeah, and in that way, you have a project of enunciation, right? Because the by affirming the partial objects, like you're saying, they're able to speak for themselves if you allow the... Um, as, hopefully that doesn't come off as a cliche, but to speak for themselves, right? 
Okay, then that earlier section, the earlier part of this paragraph, um, there use the example, thus the mouth and the anus, the mouth anus of the anorexic. Uh, forgive me, my psychoanalysis is rusty, but that's that old thing of the uh, mouth and the anus effectively being signifiers for taking in and expelling and turning them into partial objects as part of one connected machine. That, that is them turning them into signifiers. Now, is that them? And again, they talk. I, I'm this is why I'm having trouble following this entire section. Is early on they say basically, no, we're not fuck signifiers, we're not dealing with them. That's not where the machines are at. But it feels like they're literally saying, actually, no, these signifiers are machines. And I'm trying to under and instead what they're saying is that those machines are functions. So the mouth anus of the anorexic is, you know, they the, the mouth actually takes the role or the function of the anus as it expels back the food. So basically, there's like one organ with both functions for this person. I, I yeah. think there's two things. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, like, instead of taking a sort of like, I think, uh, I think like a psycho an analytic reading of that would be about like the stages of psychosexual development, right? Where the mouse and the anus get kind of swapped around and a psychoanalysis would look at it that a psychoanalysis, an analyst would look at it that way. Uh, but instead of looking at it like that, they're using this as an illustration of the disjunctive synthesis where the mouth and the anus can, uh, they swap functions because they're included as like, it, it's a disjunction that's inclusive. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's uh, a, it's less a point about semiotics and more a point about the disjunctive synthesis and the way it's recorded. Yeah, I think you guys have answered that one. I, I was going to say something about this, but I just wanted to also say, like, this is just an extension. This whole paragraph feels like an extension of the statement at the beginning of the previous paragraph of uh, one might instead wonder how these conditions of dispersion of real distinction and though the absence of a link permit any machinic re regime to exist because they give the example of, okay, imagine object X, Y, uh, there's production happening from them. Uh, how, how do they, if they're just forever distinct from each other and they don't interact because they have to be like these diff purely differential multiplicities, how does anything come out of that? But they try, but then this, they're, de they're defining, well, could there's the partial objects and kind of what initially is emitted from them, but then there's the fields of presence and the fields of presence that they kind of like constitute. There's, it's almost like a, a schematics of like leakage, as creepy as that sounds, because they're saying this, pre these fields of presence aren't like neatly, uh, they don't like, they're, they're like radial, I guess, or they're like, uh, they, they emanate outwards and they start to kind of, they're they're without saying connective disjunctive conjunctive body without organ serabatsur that's what they're they're saying you know they say that the such that the partial a and partial b become in this regard indiscernible and not just in the mixed region where this like field of presence is all everything's getting all mixed up in an orgy of fucking flows but uh since one can always assume that having exchanged their function blah 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 uh yeah, one finds before a new passive synthesis where there's a paradoxical relationship of included disjunction. And they, sorry, I skipped that part right before that, where they say where the two flows no longer overlap. Like things start to qualitatively change and permutate in that conjunctive phase. Uh, it, sorry, I'm losing my words here, but my point is, um, yeah, it, it's a recapitulation of the synthesis and it's, and it's important to understand why, if they're relying on the idea of all the flows and partial objects are all in happening in conjunction like a psychoanalyst would be like congratulations like where is the sub symbolic order like how is this all connected this would just result in like a blind automaton that does nothing this is kind of them trying to answer that yeah the, their way of going about it is very different from a psycho psychoanalyst psycho i can't say it today an analyst who's going to look at it and be like that's because you had a messed up childhood and you didn't develop right that the, the their uh, delusion guattery are not looking at it that way at all well, and to that point too, right? We see how functionality is is happening here too, right? We're normally, right? So, like, if we want to think about it in terms of the exclusive disjunction, uh, the exclusive disjunction, right? So, like, you know, the ass uh, shits and the the mouth receives, right? But the the point here seems to be that with the assemblage that's happening, and the way that that's getting recorded, and and what the subject is going to experience in the third synthesis, right? 
you have a what would appear to be paradoxical and that's um the mouth itself is is performing different functions so if you think about the mouth only as a receiver right more exclusively in that manner it's not going to make sense that the mouth is doing what it's doing here and I mean, you know, we could we could bring this to any other thing, you know, society has evolved, sexual practices has evolved as well. And the anus kind of, you know, the function of the anus has differentiated, let's put it like that. And now it's just not like, an, you know, doesn't only have the function of defecation, but, you know, Christianity and all those religions, they kind of like, you know went on the side a little bit and now it's a site of arousal it's you know there's there's all of this so basically psychoanalysis would say oh you have an anal fixation or something like this it would try to fix you into going back into a normal heterosexual time type of coitus or coit i don't know how to say this in english but you know it's a different organs can serve different functions depending on who you are, where you are, what's your cultural background, what's your the, the, the moment in history in which you are. So uh, I think I think this this kind of example, the mouth anus of the anorexic could be like explained into a whole range of instances. I like uh, I like the way you uh, brought up this sort of uh, heterosexuality as an example of the way that psychoanal psychoanalysis is going to turn these analysands towards these molar arrangements uh, because of the whole practice of pathologizing that they have. And uh, in comparison, schizoanalysis is more about, it's not about pathologizing, right? It's a self-conscious endeavor to uncover the machines that are operating in the analysands, you know, biology and mental well-being. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one, one will start with the structure into the binaries of the structure and try to analyze the real from this structure and correct the perversions because, you know, that's what they say. It's perversion. But this kind of the schizoanalysis never talks about perversion. The, the perversion is to actually try to cookie cut reality into this structure. Yeah, or to apply paralogisms, right? Is that always the case? So I'm going back through as you guys were talking. Um, I was listening, but I was going back through because I've one of the things I've been having trouble with is the three syntheses. Um, the the third synthesis, that of the conjunctive synthesis, uh, feels like they don't necessarily ascribe negativity to the pervert. They have the third synthesis is as things come together. Uh, it's going to lean one or two ways. It's going to be neurotic or perverse. Uh, neurotic is that of anti-production, uh, and the desire gets stifled. Uh, the pervert is where uh, forces of production prevail, uh, and it's entirely possible it's done in a way that's uh, due to or because of social sanctions or an or unorthodox organ connection may be maintained, uh, but it doesn't feel like it's necessarily negative if it's perverse it's not necessarily a paralogism or is it always like i guess it's worth asking in psychoanalysis i think it is i'm talking i'm talking about in their in their in anti-oedipus and in, in schizoanalysis are, are you talking about chapter one section three yeah oh yeah early early shit yes I think when they talk about the perversion in the early chapters they always talk about the pervert of psychoanalysis and they reevaluate that valuation right like they 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 uh, take some distance from this uh, judgment of perversity as i remember the syllogism is the point sign and i think the um Excuse me, the syllogism is the point sign. I think the paralogism was like the signifier, right? So like the point being like uh, in the third synthesis, the, so right, uh, libidinal energy has now uh, produced, been distributed, and now it's going into consumption, right? So as I understand, like uh, what we typically tend to think of as the subject, but more especially like these partial objects and that, they're moving through um, consumption, and in that sense, you get something. Um, but we we usually uh, think of subjectivity as exclusively a personal thing, right? For people, but uh, in this case, like 
where they talk about like Columbus simulating a whore, simulating an admiral, excuse me, an admiral simulating a whore, right? So like with the way distribution has happened in the recording, um, the, the subjects here are consuming and consummating the relationship. Okay, interesting. Hmm. Um, so, like, I probably should continue because I know they're about to get into the syntheses. I don't want to spend too much time uh, overanalyzing these chapters. We're going to have a hell of a review session as it is. Um, and what did you want to say, Jack? Oh, I was going to say that works, but uh, like with the with the wasp and the orchid, right? Like the way like the the pistol and the um the wasps, uh, shall we say, reproductive organs, how this all comes together, right? Those move through the syntheses and with the consumptive aspect, you get those, um, you get like, uh, as they say, like th those organs and those partial objects uh, performing simulations and consuming the, the surplus, right? Where they talk about like the celibate machine um, writing on the, a body, for instance, so they give the instant, uh, the example of Kafka's penal colony. Okay. Um, I will continue reading, though, because they're about to get into uh, the syntheses and even more. So, uh, these syntheses necessarily imply the position of a body without organs. This is due to the fact that the body without organs is in no way the contrary of the organ's partial objects. It is itself produced in the first passive synthesis of connection, as that which is going to neutralize, or on the contrary, put into motion, the two activities, the two heads of desire. For as we have seen, it can be produced as the amorphous fluid of anti-production, just as it can be produced as the support that appropriates for itself the flow of production. It can as well repel the organ's objects as attract them, and appropriate them for itself. But in repulsion, as in attraction, the body without organs is not in opposition to these organ's objects. It merely ensures its own opposition and their opposition with regard to an organism. The body without organs and the organ's partial objects are opposed conjointly to the organism. The body without organs is in fact produced as a whole, but a whole alongside the parts, a whole that does not unify or totalize them, but that it is added to them like a new, really distinct part. So as I remember, this is them going back to like, there's the schizophrenic and the paranoiac uh, distribution or uh, uh, connectivity, right? So like the body mm -hmm. of the organs will repel or attract um, the conjunctive syntheses. To uh, quote Holland, actually, because that's the section I was on in Holland earlier. Uh, the forces of production and anti-production also interact in other less rigid ways to produce mobile personality structures which remain closer to the continual open-ended indefinite nature of the syntheses and therefore enjoy or suffer experience with much greater intensity. As we saw, Deleuze and Guattari designate catatonia as the state of zero intensity, total breakdown. The syntheses extinguished completely, no connections, no recording, no subject. It forms a kind of baseline against which to measure the forces of attraction and repulsion operating on the active body without organs. The paranoiac experiences the entire panoply of desiring machines as threatening and wants to repel them, but without losing touch with them altogether, as the catatonic would. Here the forces of repulsion predominate, yet the forces of attraction are still in play constantly repelling the desiring machines with no prospect of ever completely succeeding, is itself a form of intensity, especially compared to the zero-degree intensity of the full body without organs. The schizo, by contrast, affirms the forces of both attraction and repulsion and takes them to the limit. Instead of being repelled or merely having their finished products registered, the connective syntheses are brought back into play and put into operation on a body without organs whose disjunctive syntheses multiply their ramifications indefinitely, thereby fueling the consummation of a perpetually renewed nomadic subject always different from itself, a permanent revolution of psychic life. Yeah, and so 
if we place this in context of chapter 4.1, uh, chapter 4, section 1, like the end of that, that section, the second diagram, this is what they're going through right here right now, is the, this breaking through the body without organs. Um, I kind of want to ask, because um, when I was revisiting some of this stuff earlier, um, I'm kind of um, wondering if anyone can help me with the... It seems like they're kind of... Uh, have a mirrored threefold synthesis to like Kant, but where they, um, in a sense, like reject the transcendental subject in Kant um, in favor of this body without organs. And I'm wondering if anyone had any um, sorts of, uh, I guess, anything more detailed about how this relates to the kind of Kantian um, framework through the through his three synthesis. First, thank you very much, Hole Dweller. <laughs> I had to say that. Um, <laughs> Roger, Eliosha, I'm sure we have someone uh, who wants to just dive in and give a quick uh, answer to this because uh, as, as Eliosha says, they explicitly talk about Kant early on. Would anyone like to dive in and give that a try? Oh, come on. I'd love someone to do this. We had this whole long session where we just talked about passive, uh, passive synthesis and tried to figure that out, right? Um, so I think the first thing to note there is that um, I don't think that it's the body without organs that occupies kind of an equivalent role to the transcendental subject. Uh, because... Uh, because Right, because first of all, the the uh, body without organs is itself a, a product of the whole process, right? It's 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 produced and it it's part of the production. Um, and it's it's not just there. That's the first thing, and then the role is very different, right? It's not it's not the active part actually because um, the subject of the synthesis if we want to even talk about a subject of the synthesis are the desiring machines like that's the whole thing about um, the molecular where the machines kind of function right it's not a subject with uh, that we can understand as kind of consciousness or something but it's a subject as it's a subject of the action right like literally um well the the most basic meaning of a, of subject basically there yeah. um and then i think we get into the problems of what passive synthesis are in contrast to what kant's um active synthesis are and i think there should probably someone else chime in what uh, uh Go ahead, Roger. Okay, uh, so um, consciousness in, in Kant, like just this, just what has been said, is is immanent to the transcendental subject. But in Deleuze, what is transcendental is the pre-individual. So, and then there's the there's the immanence to the machines. You know, the emissions, the the machines that the um, they emerge instead of being like. Uh, relating to this transcendental identity that is part of the the consciousness, so um, it's it's like it's like a reversal of um, of of getting out of the the subject to the pre individual. So this is the first move, and then to say that the pre individual gives the condition of immanence of the real. I don't know if that makes sense. Maybe I uh, like I synthesize yeah, that, it. Too that absolutely makes sense and is totally kind of what I was um like what I was uh getting at. I'm just like wondering exactly um how they um escape this uh like the transcendental subject in Kant, mm -hmm. you know. So like, this yeah, this this is this escape is to like what I said earlier, I don't know if you were here, but uh, it's to start with the relations instead of starting with the I, the objects and their identities. It's yeah. to th this this whole escape is to see the processes instead of the formalized um, objects. To it's like it's like a priority into the understanding of the real. 
I, I would add uh, just really quick because the, the Eugene Holland actually has a really great line about this that helped me. Uh, in perhaps an unfortunate choice of wording, Kant called the illegitimate metaphysical uses of the syntheses transcendent as opposed to eminent, and his philosophical critique of metaphysics transcendental. Following Kantian usage then, Deleuze and Guattari call their critique of psychoanalytic metaphysics a transcendental critique. It proceeds by distinguishing imminent from metaphysical operations in the unconscious. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they that's thing an imminent criteria. As yeah, well. that's right. Right. Really. Right. Yeah, that that helped me. I just find it I I've only recently read the first critique and going over the three synthesis and that there's so many striking um, similarities um, as far as what the three synthesis are doing. I find it's fascinating. Thank you so much for answering my question, even if it was kind of um, a digression. I appreciate it. Um, it's not that much of a digression. We're talking through the syntheses right now. So uh, trust me, you're not the only person who's having a lot of questions <laughs> during this. Please ask more. Uh, we won't, we won't object. Um, is there anything else on this paragraph before we move forward, however? I was just going to say, and I don't think we need to stop just yet, but I really like that they're, when they say this thing about the body without organs and the organs partial objects, are it's not that they're opposed, that they're conjointly opposed to the organism. And I think that might be a guiding post for us. Like I was even thinking about when I spoke earlier, organism is a very easy way to talk about things, but I think organism for them designates structure and identity and like subject in that sense. And it is kind of ironic. We've gotten to the end of the book and you know, they're, they're essentially saying the body without organs works with organs. And you're like, what the fuck are you talking? You just spent all this time <laughs> telling me it doesn't have any organs. But I, I think it makes sense because if you think about that image that they always uh, talk about of like, it's repelling and also attracting them. Like it is, it needs the organs, but not inside of it. You know, it's not an organism that contains the organisms within within itself, and you can kind of map it out in nice, like, uh, DNA, what's the, the the famous drawing of like the man with the within multiple legs and the arms and all that? Uh, it's not like that. It's that the organs are. It's always like repelling and attracting. You know, the the egg or whatever they call it. It's always repelling and attracting, and so the organs kind of almost need to exist if you want to imagine it in an image outside of it rather than inside of it. Well, uh, no, it's, it's, uh, I'm actually just going to start reading the next paragraph because it literally continues off of what you were saying. Uh, speaking of the body without organs, when it repels the organs, as in the mounting of the paranoiac machine, the body without organs marks the external limit of the pure multiplicity formed by these organs themselves insofar as they constitute a non-organic and non-organized multiplicity. And when it attracts them and fits itself over them in the process of a miraculating fetishistic machine, it still does not totalize them, totalize them, unify them in a manner of an organism. The organ's partial objects cling to the body without organs and enter into the new syntheses of included disjunction and nomadic conjunction of overlapping and permutation on this body. Syntheses that continue to repudiate the organism and its organization. Desire indeed passes through the body and through the organs, but not through the organism. That is why the partial objects are not the expression of a fragmented, shattered organism, which would presuppose a destroyed totality or the freed parts of the whole, nor is the body without organs the expression of a de-differentiated organism stuck back together that would surmount its own parts. The organs partial objects and the body without organs are at the bottom one and the same thing, one and the same multiplicity that must be conceived as such by schizoanalysis. Uh, with emphasis, partial objects are the direct powers of the body without organs and the body without organs the raw material of the partial objects. Uh, I'll come back to the footnote. The body without organs is the matter that always fills space to given degrees of intensity, and the partial objects are these degrees, these intensive parts that produce the real in space, starting from matter as intensity equaling zero. Is that what the text says, intensity equaling zero? Yes, sir. One. All right. The body without organs is the eminent substance. 
is the most Spinozist sense of the word. Mm -hmm. And the partial objects are like its ultimate attributes, which belong to it precisely insofar as they are really distinct and cannot, on this account, exclude or oppose one another. The partial objects and the body without organs are the two material elements of the schizophrenic desiring machines. The one as the immobile motor, the others as the working parts. The one as the giant molecule, the others as the micromolecules. The two together in a relationship of continuity from one end to the other of the molecular chain of desire. Uh, to go back and read the footnote. <clears throat> uh, this was to the part and emphasis. Uh, in his study, not going to try, not going to try. Uh, Pierre Bonafé. Uh, let's do it. Go. Objet magique, sorcellerie et fétichisme. Nouvelle revue de psychanalyse, numéro 2, 1970. Jesus Christ. Um, Pierre Bonafé <laughs> clearly dis demonstrates in this respect the inadequacy of a notion like that of a fragmented body. To quote, there is indeed a fragmenting of the body, but not at all with a feeling of loss or degradation. Quite to the contrary, as much for the holder as for others, the body is fragmented by multiplication. The others no longer have to do with a simple person, but with a man to the X, Y, Z power, whose life has been immeasurably increased, dispersed while being united with other natural forces, since its existence no longer rests at the center of its person, but has hidden itself in several far-off and impregnable locations. Benefe recognizes in the magic object the existence of the three desiring syntheses, the connective syntheses, which combines the fragments of the person with those of animals and plants, the included disjunctive syntheses, which records the man-animal composite, the conjunctive synthesis, which implies a veritable migration of the remainder of residue. That's actually the best and most concise version of the three syntheses I think I've ever read. Yeah, I'm kind of jealous because I'm like, oh shit, I should have put this into my dissertation. <laughs> Fuck, I feel like we should just read this footnote and then we can skip two or three paragraphs. All right, so uh, one thing I want to talk about is the body without organs here um, and how, uh, as we were talking about a moment ago, it isn't a thing that necessarily uh, only repels. Uh, organs only repels things. It's actually a attractant repellent uh, almost simultaneously uh, because of the three syntheses and the way that it is produced as part of all of those. Is that fine for everyone? Is that terribly off mark? Could you repeat it? No. Damn. Sound, sounds about right to me, Brooks. This is just more, I, I really like this section. It's the first time that they, for a lot of it, they, they talk about the body without organs almost in this like negative tone because they're mostly talking about it as a, I feel like when they draw these comparisons with capital and other things, it sounds as though it's like this this horrible thing that we need to resist. But they kind of point out here as well how the, even when it, this non-totalizing aspect, that it's even when it miraculizes, miraculizes, however you want to say it, it doesn't actually cover over the processes. We've been, that's kind of a theme we've been discussing in the last few chapters. Like they're still surging uh, on and beneath and there's always like ways for that to break. But that the... You know, for me, all of this stuff, like when I'm reading it, I'm trying to draw, as I'm sure a lot of you are. And it really is such an interesting way of thinking about like systems evolution and stuff, because you can kind of like draw it out and like see how it how it makes sense and how it works. Of so, like the different elements coming to constitute this larger body and how that body falls back onto it and all the rest of it. But like I the idea of the, uh, attraction repression of like in order, like I always have given the example of like hair cells or nails on a human body or an animal, like there, it, this is what I think of, of like, not only do the uh, flows need to break and con connect constantly in order to just create in the first place, but also like even the surfaces that are created out of that can't stay surfaces for long. And they have to keep creating like new surfaces have to, or the, the surface itself, like ship of Theseus needs to keep being replaced over time. So there's a point at which the body without organs 
can no longer simply repel connections to kind of like concretize itself. It has to also attract and reallow those connections to allow for, you know, healing so-called and change and stuff like that. Yeah, totally. And, you know, you're talking about nails and something that is organic, but we can talk about the non-human and the non-organic, such as a city. You know, city is a assemblage of different buildings and roads that are being assembles, uh, assemblages of different materials as well. But the city, you know, the desire passes through all of this, but never through the idea of the city, this body without organs that is external to its part. So it's, it's because they describe stuff that is real and it's kind of easy to understand if we use real examples instead of like keeping it into like a theoretical language like they do. Yeah, I think in some ways the body of the organs here, as I'm thinking more about it too, I see why they, they like our toe for this so much because like with the table, uh, so like with the schizophrenic table, right? There's the table and then there's the schizophrenic table is producing product identity. And in that I'm starting to see more clearly why they they call it the body without organs because it it is the it's not the table as we commonly think of a table right in the way of a, a connection of parts but it it is that potentiality of the table um, at, at this level of zero right so like as libidinal flows connect with the table and the, and the body without organs or the producing product identity is produced you do have the potentiality for all this to happen right it's um even though it's like anti-productive, it enables a lot. Can I just complain about their allegory or example they end with? They say the partial objects and the body without organs are the two material elements. They then go through, and please correct me if I'm wrong on this. They then say uh, the one is the immobile motor, the other is the working parts. They, they're shit writing here, and I want to know if it's in the original they flip it, and that's what makes this really tough for me to read and understand the first time I read this through, uh, because it starts with body without organs, starts with partial objects, and then body without organs, but then in every sentence they're on, they start with things describing body without organs and then partial objects. Am I right? Because otherwise, it's literally the opposite of how I understand all of this so far. Not to say specifically... The body without organs is the immobile motor. The partial objects are the working parts. The giant molecule is the body without organs. The micromolecules are the partial objects. That's how I understand it. Yeah, I think that is the only way to see it. God, I hate their writing sometimes. And it's always a matter of scale. It really depends where you start or where you want to end with this. It is also crazy to think that that second part of that italicized sentence, the body without organs, is the raw material of the partial objects. Because it's so easy to think, even as the macromolecule type thing, to think of it as this, like, we always fall into, like, the ideas of superstructure almost. But, like, it's as if the structure, it's like a fucking gingerbread house or something, you know, like, the material of the body without organs itself, even as it's Serabat surring itself all the way to the bank is like it's still it, it it's like the very wall the walls that makes it sound like structure again but you know the very stuff of it is still it doesn't it's not static it's still providing part of the you know the basis for these flows to create their fields of presence well it's really as they've talked about the the flows are being carved on the body without organs and i've i've always enjoyed that allegory because it's about these cavernous sort of scars being placed on a human body like in the primitive times and uh in between that is still the skin of the body it's still uh the flesh sort of filling those things in and the deeper the cut or the stronger the flow the wider that gap is it's that's the fight is the the space the imminent substance of everything that's sitting between uh, the flows and the partial objects, and that's the body without organs. Always in that sort of back and forth pushing, trying to close off and trying to uh, break flows. But that's still into the notion of marking. You know, if we want to go back to the example of the nail or the skin, um, so th the skin, we don't start with the skin or we don't start with the nail. We need to start with the function in a world that is dangerous, 
uh, there's a function of protection and a function of clawing. And then the nail um, actually comes from, it, it, it evolves uh, from this function of clawing and the skin evolves from this uh, function of protection into a hostile environment. So that's, that's how they see it. So it's always a relation to an ecology that produces the parts. Well, and, and that goes with sort of uh, one of the things that I've been wanting to talk about is uh, the first section of actually chapter of Logic of Sense, where he talks about the nature of sort of becoming. The example he gives is with Alice. Alice takes eats something to get bigger. And we realize that at any given moment, Alice is the size that she is. But anytime we say that she's getting bigger, by necessity, we also have to consider her when she was smaller, that these images have to exist in our mind very much at the same time. That's the machine of Alice beginning, essentially. That's Alice beginning as a machine. So if we're talking about any one of these machines sort of operating and how the flows sort of move through them, it's necessary to understand the relations in time between the machine to itself, the machine to other machines, these partial objects and how they play. Yes, Lou, this is Bergson. This is not even slightly Bergson. This is just Bergson par excellence, basically. Um, but it's, it's all part of that same thing. Yeah, I can't speak to birdsong, but uh, I like the way you explained that, Roger, because I, I think that's right in the sense that, like, if you go into the cold, right, the body without organs is not uh, the body with skin. It's the body without skin and, and, and all that. It's almost like a, it's like, it's almost like the inverse of the assemblage in a weird way. But at, at that same time, it's got all the potentiality for the, the skin to change, to adapt. Mm -hmm. But the assemblage is, is a result also of the possibilities given by the virtual. You know, the virtual is the clawing, the protection, and the assemblage can only, um, there's a field of possibility that emerges, and the actualization of this assemblage as a, a body with skin and, and nails um, can only happen into a certain parameter of arrangement or assemblage of different um flows and matter responding to the virtual yeah i think that's why recording is so imperative there i'm only comparing it to the inverse in what i said earlier but yeah with recording right like you get as different functions um are opened up right new possibilities and potentialities are exposed especially as intensities will come to interact with them all right i will continue the chain is like the apparatus of transmission or of reproduction in the desiring machine. Insofar as it brings together, without unifying or uniting them, the body without organs and the partial objects, the desiring machine is inseparable both from the distribution of the partial objects on the body without organs and from the leveling effect exerted on the partial body by the body without organs, which results in appropriation. The chain also implies another type of synthesis than the flows. It is no longer the lines of connection that traverse the productive parts of the machine, but an entire network of disjunction on the recording surface of the body without organs. And we have doubtless been able to present things in a logical order where the disjunctive synthesis of recording seemed to follow after the connective synthesis of production. With a part of the energy of production, libido, being converted into a recording energy, Newman. But in fact, from the standpoint of the machine itself, there is no succession that ensures the strict coexistence of the chains and the flows, as well as the body without organs and the partial objects. The conversion of a portion of the energy does not occur at a given moment, but is a preliminary and constant constitution of the system. The chain is the network of included disjunctions on the body without organs inasmuch as these disjunctions resect the productive connections. The chain causes them to pass over the body without organs itself, thereby channeling or codifying the flows. However, the whole question is in knowing whether one can speak of a code at the level of this molecular chain of desire. We have seen that a code implied two things, one or the other, or the two together. On the one hand, the specific determination of the full body as a territoriality of support. On the other hand, the erection of a despotic signifier on which the entire chain depends. 
In this regard, in vain is the axiomatic in profound opposition to codes. Since it works on the decoded flows, it cannot itself proceed except by affecting re-territorializations and by reviving the signifying unity. The very notions of code and axiomatic therefore seem to be valid only for the molar aggregates, where the signifying chain forms a given determinate configuration on a support that is itself specifically determined and in terms of a detached signifier. These conditions are not fulfilled without exclusions forming and appearing in the disjunctive network, at the same time as the connective lines take on a global and specific meaning. Well, let's uh, take apart part of it because I think I'm not the only person. Uh, I, I, I'm with Alyosha. I get some of it, uh, but uh, other parts I, I would not say that I understand. So let's talk about the chain. Uh, the chain of desire, uh, the molecular chain that they're talking about. Um, it is the apparatus of transmission, is like the apparatus of transmission or of reproduction in the desiring machine. And so far as it brings together without unifying or uniting them, the body without organs. What is this chain? It, it does, it feels like they're talking about sort of the Lacanian symbolic order, the chain of symbols that determined who we are, how we blah, 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 the signifying chain, etc. This is what they're talking about, but they are talking about the molecular chain of desire here. So, help? That's it? That's as far as I can talk? I think it's like, it's less a chain in terms of having to do with like Lacan and semi semiotics and more like like a literal chain of these flows going from one object to another. I think it is the signifying chain, but from the standpoint of how it's how recording occurs in uh, in relation to the body without organs, because if I remember correctly, like they then they do a whole thing where they took apart Lacan's signifying chain and sort of re-territorialized them. So right, uh, like here, the big I, thing I seems I to think, be yeah, good. but I don't think it's a chain of signifiers, but the chain of production. Yeah, I think we go back to like a full Marxist thing and saying that the molecular is producing itself. And not producing itself, but like you understand what I mean. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's not signifiers like uh, as we typically think about them, but it's it's the functions as they've been recorded. So really, with the the mouth, right? It's the the, the function of eating, or the function of uh, shitting, or the function of I don't know whistling, right? And you get the the either or 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 as opposed to the either or, which would be that more like paranoiac thing. Mm -hmm. And also uh, what they said earlier into this, um, into Pierre Bonafé, like the X plus Y, Z, you know, it's the addition of those. It's like the cumulative, it's like a, uh, it's like a rolling rock, you know, like, but in this case that like attracts everything that it passes through and it changes through everything. So it's being transformed and it has a productive function into its environment, but also in itself. So this old chain of syntheses that are happening as uh, there's movement. And when I say movement, it's not really, it's not only spatial movement. Well, they say, as Bart, they say at the bottom of the page there, the chain is the network of included disjunctions on the body without organs. And as much as these disjunctions resect the productive connections, it, the chains cause them to pass over to the body without organs itself, thereby channeling or codifying the flows. The reason I had said in chat that I feel like it, it's related to signifying chains is mostly kind of what uh, Jack had said, that this whole book is like an implicit and explicit critique of psychoanalysis. And again, I think that they're trying to make another move by appropriating this term because they're, they're talking about desire and desire for like psychoanalysis immediately goes into meaning and signification. And mm -hmm. But they're saying, they're sorry. Sorry, no, that's my fault. Go ahead. I was just going to say, so like then for them, it's like, okay, you, you want to talk about a signifying chain. So in a sense, you're, I, maybe I'm saying you're both correct that like, they're like, well, it's not about a signifying chain. It's, it is a chain, but it's not a chain of meaning. It's a chain of this like productive, this series of productive forces, the network of included disjunctions that moves across this, like these surfaces. So, yeah. Yes. 
um, I, later, and, you know, I'm the I'm the thousand plateau person, but uh, they would they would say about the plane of expression, and you know, there's a whole there's a whole difficulty there. When we talk about the plane of expression, we talk, we think of expression into the word or the symbol, but that's not what they're referring to. What they're saying is the plane of expression is how matter express itself. Also, so I think that you know uh, what you just said uh, is is all right because it encompasses. The symbolic, uh, the semiotic, but also the material expression. So this chain can encompass all those different levels at the same time. All right. What, what do you guys make? Can I just ask? What do you guys make of this? Because I was. Trying... They kind of. I don't think that they're actually contradicting themselves, at least as far as they believe. But you know, on page three twenty-seven, they're like. So the chain causes them to pass over the body through organs itself, channeling or codifying the flows. And like literally just a few sentences later, or perhaps I think it might be actually be in the next paragraph. So maybe we'll get to that in a second. It's like they say, well, it's not really codifying anything. In fact, what they do is they uh, decode everything. And they this chain of, of molecular desire actually decodes everything. So I'm like, okay, so I looked back at the first sentence. and like, they're not saying it kind of does. They say it codifies the flows. So I'm trying to reconcile both orders in my head at once so how i'm how i read that is that it uh they the job of these chains essentially is to codify flows but a thing can't be codified if it's already codified and so it only works on decoded flows it's a uh, hey i i i only make soda so i can't start with pepsi i have to start with water if you give me pepsi i'm fucked uh so I have to start with the water and the ingredients. This is what I think they're saying there. But you can make Pepsi clear, though, and you can well, make Pepsi yeah, yeah. Uh, diet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, that, but, that, but that's the thing. That's differentiation. Differentiation is the code that is being decoded and recoded. So differentiation is the whole movement of the territorialization, de- and re-territorialization as well. So th- this chain is always working as you know a constant reassemblage of things. Yes, but if we're going to move further into this topic, I think we've got to approach what they're... Sorry, they're talking about the axiomatic and the socius now. So we've got to, we've got to square that with what's going on with um, great capital, the axiomatic. Well, and it, I, I do want to make sure we're... At this point so far, I believe we're also only talking about molar chains. No, I don't think so. Well, there's a molar chain of desire. That's, they specifically say that. They don't right. they, where paragraph three twenty seven the yep. molecular desire. So that's why I, I feel like they're bringing all these things. It's the reverse. They're bringing all the but into the molecular. Okay, so not to get ahead of myself, uh, I did pre-read this. The next paragraph is about what they call a properly molecular chain, and that's let let me read the next paragraph. We're going to come back to this. But it is another case altogether with the properly molecular chain, insofar as the body without organs is a non-specific and non-specified support that marks the molecular limit of the molar aggregates. The chain no longer has any other function than that of deterritorializing the flows and causing them to pass through the signifying wall, thereby undoing the codes. The function of the chain is no longer that of coding the flows on a full body of the earth, the despot or capital, but on the contrary, that of decoding them on the full body without organs. It is a chain of escape and no longer a code. The signifying chain has become a chain of decoding and deterritorialization, which must be apprehended and can only be apprehended as the reverse of the codes and territorialities. This molecular chain is still signifying because it is composed of signs of desire. These signs are no longer signifying given the fact that they are under the order of the included disjunctions where everything is possible. These signs are points whose nature is a matter of indifference. Abstract machinic figures that play freely on the body without organs and as yet form no structured configuration, or rather they form one no longer. As Jacques Monod says, we must conceive of a machine that is such by its functional properties, but not by its structure. Quote, where nothing but the play of blind combinations can be discerned. Unquote. It is precisely the ambiguity of what the biologists call a genetic code that enables us to understand this kind of situation. 
or if the corresponding chain effectively forms codes in as much as it folds into exclusive molar configuration, it undoes the codes by unfolding along a molecular fiber that includes all the possible figures. Similarly, in Lacan, the symbolic organization of the structure, with its exclusions that come from the function of the signifier, has as its reverse side the real in organization of desire. Now, before anyone says anything, we're going to stop there for the day for reading. I want to actually spend 10 or 15 minutes talking about this because this chain part, I don't fucking understand. I will say I was inclined to believe you, Brooks, but then I'm looking at the paragraph and it says, even in the even towards the end of that page 327, they're asking themselves this. First of all, all the, the terms they're discussing are the same terms we've been discussing throughout this section. So they're definitely molecular. And then they say, however, the whole question is in knowing whether one can speak of a code at the level of this molecular chain of desire. So I think as far as they're concerned, they have been discussing that. But I, I would agree. So I, I, I agree. I think maybe I maybe I misspoke when I said molar. Um, what I'm talking about is they kind of have decided there's two chains. Let's call one uh, one that's been properly signified. It's already got it's already been coded a molecular chain that's already been coded by that nature. That's not anymore what they're talking about when they say properly molecular. Because at that point, once it's been coded, it's actually been integrated. And only, I would say there's only one chain, though. Because there's only one chain. The molar and the molecular are always encompassed within one another. And, uh, but, but it's a different, you know, the, the way of the intensity in the aggregates works. Uh, you can read it in two ways, but there's only one. Yeah, I agree with Roger. There's only one flow. So like if you go back to that diagram on 282, this is what they're um, expounding on is the way that uh, uh, the desiring production moves through the uh, the paranoic and the um, uh, the schizophrenic, right? So like it gets, it's, aff it's affected by the, uh, the territorial machine of the primitive, of the despotic, and of the capital, right? And it goes through coding and decoding, right? And then it hits the body of the organs and it's either going to bounce right back, which is, uh, I think you guys gave it a great example of that when, right, the, the desiring production of uh, drinking soda pop, right, instead, instead of getting like beyond Pepsi, we get crystal Pepsi, right, a complete waste of time, but it's paranoia, right, it's the same damn thing, or it breaks through, which is what they're, uh, I think they're gesturing toward now in terms of like, what is the, uh, the the very the very thing that Alyosha just read? Is it possible to speak of codes at the um, sub molecular level? I mean, it might just be that this is an epistemological kind of like section, and they're just they they do this whole entertaining. What if we apply the ideas of code on this molecular? And then they do all this stuff, and then two seconds later, they're like, "But actually, this code stuff." doesn't quite work in that way and that's why we need to find it and say it in this way i i really think it's worth us these these three paragraphs go from basically what i see as uh chains that are absorbed clearly and on the paranoiac side because they definitely get attached to the body without organs and then they specifically say that this uh properly molecular chain is that of the schizo and is the one that is free to dance around the body without organs being able to understand the difference between the two of those is feels extremely important to me. I know it's not necessarily two chains. Uh, I'm speaking of them as they are. I think what they're talking about here is they're actually talking about the perceptual side of things, not that there are two chains, but that when we see them or we're talking about them, one is a chain we can easily speak about and uh, we can talk about sort of that uh, uh, not sub-molecular, but ultra-molecular, the other side of it, where it's much more towards the molar because they have signs, they have all these things that we can describe. We need to be able to talk about this other, this properly molecular chain is actually the thing we can't describe and we can't talk through. That's at the top of 328 is what I read. Uh, to read Alyosha, the very notions of code and axiomatic therefore seem to be valid only for molar ag aggregates, where the signifying chain forms a given determinate configuration on a support that is itself specifically determined and in terms of a detached signifier. These conditions are not fulfilled without exclusions forming and appearing in the disjunctive network at the same time as the connective lines take on a global and specific meaning. 
that's where things are taken into the body without organs. When things take on that global and specific meaning, is that wrong? And actually, I'm going to ask Angus this question. It's a really uh, axiomatics are not are axiomatics molecular? No, they're molar. Well, I would argue then we're talking then. Axiomatics have to operate on this chain. No? Well, no, but I mean... The axiomatics are with the, uh, the socius, right? So I think what they're getting at is the way that, like... So the way the socius is affecting uh, social machines and more directly, like, what's happening with desiring production there, right? As, as it moves toward the body without organs... It can bounce back and break down, as they say, or it can break through. So, like with the with the axiomatic there, right? That that level of um, decoding is happening um, to desiring production, and that is flowing through these desiring machines as we're talking about them. I wonder if they're talking about something. It seemed very similar to me in the um, someone was talking about a thousand plateaus, but um, in the micropolitics and segmentarity section they talk about the kind of molecular lines like in the kind of um like a molecular level of this we this is where we have our like vectors of deterritorialization they can either um break through to the body without organs or they can be um axiomatized and like made to signify and brought back into the kind of um segmentarity um like the i guess symbolic order in a way and i i don't know if that um helps at all I think it does in some way, you know, it's like, I think it's easier to think about this when we take real world example. Let's take the example of gender, for example, the molecular gender is, you know, the, 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 the cis heterosexual man. And that's, that's, you know, that's going to be the universal, the reference point in everything. Uh, if we take it from a detorialization point uh, of a view or perspective, everything will be in regard to this, into it would be a difference in regard to this, uh, uh, this this identity that we put there. But on a molecular level, nobody is really that, and you know, people are just doing stuff. So gender is just something that is way more fluid, and you know, people are just connecting stuff together, performing, doing whatever. And but at the same time, these differentiation. Uh, in gender can become axiomatized, you know, identities of trans of different other thing can re-enter the uh, molar axiom at one point. So it's 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 either we we let them flow as an escape, or we recodify into like the seven, 72 genders of Facebook. You know, I don't know if that makes sense because I'm not a specialist of that question. That makes sense to me, at least. That's exactly um, what I was getting at, kind of this question, you know, what are you? Um, you know, and there's these kind of molecular lines um, taking off that um, are, like, axiomatized to make signify, oh, I am this now. Um, we, we now have a, a signifier, a way to, a way to um, codify this, and, and axioms for it. I think everything moved into the chat. And people... I, I think I think it did a lot. A lot did move into the chat. A lot. A, a lot did move into the chat. I think a lot of that works for me. It's. Uh, I mean, we're we're into some really specific stuff for me because, uh, obviously, my big interest in all of this is uh, the actual activities or practices that can come from this work at a material level. So being able to understand what they consider to be the processes that these things happen, how they come about, how they, we can find the lines of escape, um, how chains of escape and not code can become things, uh, how we can move and play in a, in a different way is important. So there's a lot to review over this, but uh, we are a bit over two o'clock. Uh, so I am going to slowly end this. Thank all of you uh, for joining us today. We will continue tomorrow. Uh, same time, same place, noon here. And we will continue reading on from page 328 of my text, uh, continuing with uh, their 
explanation of the body without organs as a model of death and their switch of the death drive is I think going to be continuing to be very important for us to grasp. So please join us and uh, we look forward to it. Thank you very much.